the the dua that we mentioned yesterday is we call it muqtabis. This is oh oh I'm sorry. Open it up, young man. Help him out, help him out. Because you gotta do it on both sides. Okay, Alhamdulillah, you're Keep opening it, keep opening it, open it more. Keep opening it, right there, okay? Is anybody else there? She's there? Come on, you got to open it up. All right. Assalamu alaikum. What's today's day? Today on the what's today's so it's the 10th, 12th, 11th, which is Ashara min Barmata wa Baraka wa Fima. Listen, there's a thing in, 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 in Balagha called Muqtabis. Like when you take a statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you kind of use it, you alter it a little bit to, 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 to make a meaning, okay? So in Surah Al-Hujrat, there's an ayah with a similar meaning, saying as a statement of fact that we would dislike certain things. And so it's been turned into an I. Okay? Let me we turn it. It's oh into a sorry. I said it's been turned into an I. I stuck for the law. There's a mistake in, in, on the tongue was stuck for the And it has been turned into a dua by some of the people Ayah number seven in Surah to Hujrat. And from Hujrat, basically, well, actually, Surah to Qaf, going forward, that's like the, the, the Fadl, you know, it's the, the portion of the Quran that has, that we don't know is attached to any of the previous revelations. Whereas the rest of the Quran is connected to all the previous revelations. And it's very, to me, a very important uh, nukta, point that the rest of the Qur'an, most of the Qur'an, is tied and a re-representation, presentation of the meanings of what came in previous revelations. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so for what we've been doing is nothing but the real Torah. As the Prophet ﷺ said in a famous hadith, that I have been given in place of the Torah a sabat tuwa, the seven long surahs. And it's really not seven long surahs, it's from Surah Al Baqarah to Surah Tu. Tawbah. Okay? Surah Al Baqarah, so to Surah Al Tawbah. Allah's Messenger says, in place of the Torah, right? Because the Torah was messed up, we've been given these from what Baqarah to uh, the Tawbah. I should remember that, right? <laughs> I was getting, because I call it bara'a, because you know, it's, that's the thing about it. So, alhamdulillah, so what we're studying and have been studying so far is the real Torah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hey. Now, in Surah Al-Hujrat, the dua, I'm sorry, the statement that comes in Surah Al-Hujrat is, يعني ولكن الله حبب إليكم الإيمان وزينه في قلوبكم وكرح إليكم الكفر والفسق والعصيان أولئك هم الراشدون. Okay. So instead of instead of saying okay, however Allah has made it loving to you, iman, and made beautiful to you in your hearts, made it very attractive to you in your hearts, and made you disgusting for you, made it, you hate, you know, kufr and open shameless sinning and disobedience, the ones who have this quality, these qualities, then these are the ones that have been rightly guided, okay? They're on the right path, Rashidun. So from that understanding in this ayah, 
we've been taught to ask for those qualities. Does that make sense? Yeah. So from there, says Allah, makes it like that. We say, <coughs> Allahumma. Follow me. Allahumma. Allahumma. Habib. Ilayna. Al Iman. Wa Zayinhu Zayinhu Fi Kulubina Oh Allah Now English doesn't follow Arabic So we can't go and say it the way we would say it in English With the Arabic like that so the Arabic would say, oh Allah, which could mean, oh my God. Okay? Habib, make it loving to us, Iman. But make us love Iman, okay? Or make Iman loving to us. How we would say it in English, right? Wazayinum, beautify it, make it attractive, okay? And beautify it in our hearts, okay? Why is this important? This word zayin is very, very important. Because Allah said, Zuyina linnasi hubbu shahawati mina nisa. Okay, the first thing says that it has been zuyina, attractive. Okay? Zina, this is husna zina. Okay? Dressing up is your, your, the way you throw your clothes on, looking good. So it looks good to you. Zuyina linnas. So zayyinu fi qulbi. Why? Because people are attracted to things, they want to do it. And shaitan has made disobedience attractive right when I say shaitan I mean the real shaitan I'm not talking about you know the government or, or Trump or anything I'm talking about really shaitan okay and that's why when we watch these movies though you should unclick the fingers though nah. you know the, the Prophet Sallallahu said that when you do that shaitan stands on your hands so you know especially in a master he said so we see in the movies we watch, or we see, they'll make the criminal activity attractive. You see that? By the end or the middle or some portion of the movie, you're rooting for the zany. You're rooting for the sadic, the thief, the criminal. They show him having so, some type of moral character or something attractive, and you're angry about the people who are trying to go against him. Right? You see how that has made it attractive. The, the, the people when they act ugly and they do certain things that they do, these actors or, or these fashion, they make the children or the young people, and even the old people want to do that. Now that's what we're talking about when we say Zayinhu fi qulubina. Make Iman attractive to us. People sometimes say, you know, why you dress like that, man? You're a little extreme. Yo, know, but you can dress like that. How are you dressing? What's the difference? You know? Well, you, you buy a clothing of some sports player and wear his shirt with his name on the back one. And his number, you know how many children he has and where he got married, what color car he has, and all that stuff. But we can't know who our prophet was and what he used to dress like or they used to dress like and, and get the khalaq. We can't be fans of the prophets. Do you get my point? Salawatullah wa salamuhum alayhi. Salamuhum alayhi. So, you know, we have to put things into context. You know, one time, a, 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 a what's the guy called it? Don't believe in, a, in, in anything? In, in Atheist. Atheist. Atheist came to me. Oh, man, you're really, you know, like strict. Or you stick to your deen. I said, you stick to yours too. You know? He, he does. He was a white guy. I said, see, you got a plaid shirt on and your jeans. That's your sunnah. Right? That's your son, and this is ours. And both of us stick to our culture. <laughs> Deen is meaning culture. So I say that so that we can put it into context. Who are we imitating? Okay? Now, of course, there are certain things in every culture that is apolitical, so to speak. It's that meaning it has no religious context. And those things are for everyone. Like a coat. 
and these things like that. But there are certain things that are have significance, and we have to be intelligent enough, sophisticated enough, to be able to recognize those particular things and know the truth about those realities and apply them. But we need help because the law allows us to see things or he makes us blind. Allah teaches us in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, Summun bukmun umyun fahum la yarja'un. What's the connection to being deaf, dumb, and blind so they'll never return? If we go to the tafsir, it says they get so used to looking at falsehood. It's not real. So when they see the truth, they can't see it as the truth. They become blind to it. That can't be real. Remember the story of the people in the cave with their necks tied to the walls and the fire behind them? So when things walked by, all they saw was the shadows of reality hitting the wall. When they broke the chains and they saw the real thing, they said, that can't be it, because they're used to seeing it like that. Okay, that can't be a man, because a man looks like this on the shadow. When they looked at a real man, no. So they were blind to that reality. And that's the way we are when we get engulfed and raised up in the Western culture, the Kafir culture, so that when we see the reality, sometimes it's so bright. And then, remember, they're in a cave. When they came out the cave and the sun hit them, the light of the sun, oh man, that's oppressive. That's too much. Because it's hurting our eyes. Let's go back in the cave. It was better for our eyes. You get my point? Yes. And that's the way it is for us sometimes. Till we get accustomed to that pure light, soothing, and how much better it is than any of this. Any of this, this artificial light does nothing compared to the bright light of the sun. The difference is amazing. It cannot be imitated. So, sumun, bukmun, omyun, is that they get so used to watching falsehood. Let's say it. People watch these movies that are not true. So when they see a, a documentary or something that's actually the true story, it, they don't have no stomach for it. They can't even watch that. They can binge watch a falsehood program for hours. But if they were to watch the reality history of some real people or anything, they couldn't watch it for longer than an hour, maybe. That's what we talk about, Zuyina, being having the stomach, being attracted to it. They get so used to hearing lies from the media on the internet and the news telling us all these type of things. Some people told me before that we live in Africa, we live in trees. So I was with some guys from the Congo at the time and they said, they used to call me Mr. America. What they talk about us in America, Mr. America? I said, yeah, they think we live in trees. They say this, that and everything. He said, do you see us killing our colleagues when we go to school? Our students, you know, going to school and killing their colleagues and their teachers? Have we ever lynched anybody? Let them think we live in trees. So they don't come here and mess up our, you know. <laughs> it's the thing. And, it, 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 and it's just the reality. And then they said more than that, some other things like, you know, say, what do they say about us? And that's, they said, well, they say we got big lips. They say we like watermelon and, and chicken. So, well, what do they eat? And, they, and I was like, well, they eat spaghetti and you know, hamburgers, well, you know, yeah, we do love some watermelon and we love, you know, and we got some beautiful, so they took it a different way. Well, we get offended when they say those types of things, okay? <clears throat> well, what's wrong with they? We got big lips, some of us, right? Is it a problem? No. You like watermelon? You like watermelon. Who don't like watermelon? You get my point? But we, we have to learn how to, and, and, you know, accept these things. But you get so used to hearing falsehood that when you hear the truth, you don't believe it. Okay? So it's like you're deaf. And we get so used to talking lies, repeating stuff on the internet. Now it's so, so popular. People see something and they carry it on. This is a form of lying in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, It is enough for a man to be considered a liar that he repeats everything that he hears. This is why in Balagha, you are a liar if you said so and so, Zaid went to the store. Why? Because Amr told you, Zaid, you say, hey, where's Zaid? Amr said, oh, Zaid went to the store. So you go and tell somebody else, they say to you, where's Zaid? You say, Zaid went to the store. Do you know that Zaid went to the store? 
No, you can't say Zayd went to the store. This is in Arabic, a lie. You have to say, Amr told me Zayd went to the store. Now you, you covered yourself, you spoke the truth. But if you say Zayd went to the store and you did not know it, okay? Number one, you're lying. If you say, well, so-and-so told, but you didn't say that. You said it like you knew it, so you was lying. Because you misrepresented it as though you knew it. You guys get my point? Yeah. So, we get so used to speaking lies, speaking falsehood, repeating things, that we are no longer in the habit of speaking the truth. And that's why it's book move. So in order, because of that, they'll never be able to return to the truth. And that's what the the, 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 the subtlety of the ayah, meaning summun bukun unyum fahum la yarjiun. But because of following all those lies, they'll never be able to return to the truth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because they never get the stomach to hear it, the eyes to see it anymore, and the, the ability to speak it. May Allah protect us from that. Amen. Okay, man, this is when people try to overdo it, they fail. You know, they take on too much too quick, then they can't do it, and they stop doing it altogether. But again, it's like any other sickness, you start giving the, 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 the cure little by little, little by little, and then we go. So this dua, he teaches us, that's the first part. Allahumma. Allahumma. Habib ilayna. Habib ilayna. Al imana. Al imana. Wa zayyinhu fi qulubina. Wa zayyinhu fi qulubina. Zayyinhu fi qulubina. Zayyinhu fi qulubina. Now some people say, well, can I say it in English? I usually say no. We have because we have to break. I said we want to change everything to suit us. We're not willing to do anything that's going to cause us a little discomfort. Get us out of our comfort. You will never attain greatness staying in your comfort zone. And the greatest thing you can get is iman and entered into Jannah. And also learning it in this way, there is multiple, much more barakah. Okay, and saying it in the words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that this is the language of Jannah. Okay? But we get so tripping on racism. Especially, it's really funny that African descendants trip over speaking Arabic. When the most spoken language in Africa is Arabic. The most Arabs in the world are African. But because we have this racist lie in our head, we don't see that. Just think about it. Where is the Sahara Desert? Where is the largest desert in the world? Africa. Where are the Arabs considered? Arabs in the what? Desert. You can fit Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, all of them, the whole Middle East, in North Africa three times. Three times. But we have this thing in our, in our mind because somebody else shows you a picture of a lighter skinned Arab, you think that's the, the, the Arab. It doesn't make any sense. We gotta really open your eyes and think about that. Every, what is the African alphabet? Arabic letters. That's the, uh, every Arab, every African language is written in, well not everyone, because you still have, you do have the, the Amharic, which is not written in this, but besides Amharic, it's written in, Arab, um, what do you call it, Arabic script. There's only three scripts in the world. You have the Arabic script, you have the European, which is the Roman uh, script, which is used in all of Europe, and you have the Asian script, the Chinese script, or characters. For the most part, that's it. You have some exceptions, Sanskrit and the Amharic alphabet. Besides that, you got the whole world right there. Those who write the Arabic script, all of Africa, all of Asia, including Turkey, including, uh, 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 yeah, what is it, Urdan, what is that place? Not Urdu, Urdu people, the, the people. Pakistan and India, it's all the same. The same, their language, their, their language is written in Arabic too. So we have to get this racist mentality out of our head as well, okay? Everybody, every African I meet, every African American, says we come from Egypt. Egypt is one small, small country in Africa, one. We're not all from, from, from Egypt, you know? 
So we have to, we have to think about the places why, why But because of this mentality, you know, we keep falling victim to falsehood. So we have to be just and honest and really just drop all the, 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 the preconceived ideas and go with an honest approach to learning. Inshallah ta'ala. So, Allahumma habib ilayna al-imana. Allahumma fi qulubina. Now, not just that. This is the one way. Make it beautiful for us, right? Give us love for it. But what? The opposite has to be there too. Wa karrih. Wa karrih. Karrih. Karrih is the word makruh. Right? We know this word. We know what dislike. No, makro is not disliked. We this is, this is a we've been suckered into a lot of bad translations. You know why? Because the people that came here, who were the immigrants who spoke English, uh, when they first came here, they were scared. Some of them still scared. Okay, scared they're gonna get kicked out if they say something wrong. So you gonna you knowledge is biased. You see from where you sit. Okay, so. Now, I'm, if I say something, it's going to cause me to kick, lose my citizenship. And my family struggled to get together to get me here so we can make money and I can send it back to them. I'm not going to say anything that's going to jeopardize that. I understand it. Okay? And remember, colonialism was just as bad as slavery. Because a lot of people say, oh man, you know, you guys were slaves. Well, you guys were colonized. Okay? And the colonization is getting punked in your own country. So they, they had to change their ways in order to not get locked up and treated by these despot, uh, you know, um, dictators and, and, and fake, you know, puppet, uh, you know, leaders, okay? So that's what they had to deal with. And that becomes part of the history that they bring with them when they come here. Not realizing that, you no, know, it's the same thing in actuality. The same people, half the time, the despot leaders are trained here. So it is the exact same thing. What was the natija? The result is that the translations were watered down. Okay? That's the, that's the result. So we can still, so makruh becomes disliked. Right? Disliked. It's more than hated. It's disgusting. Allah gives us an example of what is makruh in the same surah. He said, if you would eat the dead flesh of your brother, what would you do? Lakarih tumu. Right? You would have, you would have, you know, it would be disgusting to you to eat the dead flesh of your brother. Right? I see your face. He sees his face and oh. That's what makrua is. Something that's repulsive, something that's disgusting, something that turns your stomach. That you just not, you would not do. Does that make sense? And not every word has to have an English equivalent in one word. Remember, English is the weaker language. Arabic is the more comprehensive. So it's sometimes impossible to translate. Okay? Like Ar Rahman and Rahim. It's impossible to translate that Rahim is the description of Rahman. Okay? Like we in English, we say the White House. You can't say the Rahim Rahman because you don't know what both words mean. But in English, that's what it would mean. Does that make sense? Now, so karrih, make it disgusting for us. Wa karrih ilayna. Louder, please. Wa karrih ilayna. And make it disgusting for us. Make what disgusting for us? Al kufra. Al kufra. Wa karrih ilayna al kufra. Please speak louder. Wa karrih ilayna al kufra. Meaning, make kufr disgusting to us. Isn't that a beautiful dua? Make kufr just that's what we need. Why? Because those of us who have converted to Islam or been raised here long enough have become comfortable with kufr. We become accustomed to it. Okay? We see some things that have totally traumatized us. So if we see something less than that, oh, it ain't so bad. That ain't so bad. 
bad we become. Enough. It's not bad enough because our level of disgust and uh, has been has been smashed. You know, so we have a high, you know, capability of taking so much that it's not healthy for us. So we have to go back. وَكَرِّحْ إِلَيْنَا الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوق فسوق والفسوق What is فسوق? فسوق is the plural of fisk, right? Hey, Allah's Messenger told us to watch out from kevin, right? From lying because it needs to fujur, what it needs to fisk, you know? Fisk is like when you see that person out on the street cursing. Talking on the phone, like right in broad daylight in front of your grandmother. He don't care. Talking for the old people, young babies in there, and he's cussing or she's cussing. And they're having a blatant conversation that's obscene in public. And look at you like you're crazy. What? And they'll curse at you. What that? Every other word, every, every word is an expletive. That's, that's for so open sin. Or the, the homosexual guy who walks out and blatantly says he's, he's gay, you know, and he acts like you wrong for, for having a problem, you know? But I can halfway understand that because he's crazy anyway, you know? He's got a mental problem. But, you know, you guys get my point. Shameless sinner. Shameless. Even nowadays, they even tell you to don't shame nobody. Why not? When did shame become a shame? So what for suku? Well, is yan. Well, is yan. Is yan. Why is yan? Oh, so, oh, okay. I thought you would ask me. Is yan is from asa to be disobedient. Okay, to refuse to do what Allah told you to do. Some people like that. You know, we've gotten, again, accustomed to it. And have no shame about it. So we want Allah to make it disgusting for us. Does that make sense? Allahumma. Habib ilayna. Al-Imana. Wa zayyinhu. Fi qulubina. Wa karrih ilayna. Al-Kufra. Wa al-Fusuqa. Wa al-Isyan. Ameen. This is a, to me, this is a very, very important dua for us who keep witnessing al-kufru wal-fusuq wal isyan Because whatever you see, you get used to. And we don't want to get used to it. We don't want to become comfortable with it. Does that make sense? Yes. So may Allah allow us uh, you know, to, to make something disgusting for us. Because anything that you disgust it with, you'll stay away from. Right? Okay, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. We have been in Surah to Nisa, following the, 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 the goings on in Surah to Nisa, and it's impossible. I don't want to, you know, stay on this Surah for, 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 for a long, long time. Surah to Nisa, one of the things that we learn about Surah to Nisa is that it's indicated in Surah to Ali Imran. The two main stories in Ali Imran are by, by who? Hanawel, Maryam, right? right? The two women. And then some of the ulama say that's indicative that the next surah is going to be about Nisa. And then we see how in Surah to Nisa, how it says, Ya ayyuhan nas, it begins with Ya ayyuhan nas, why? Because it's talking about justice and establishing what? What is it establishing? A, a house of fa a family. First and foremost is establishing a family. So the person, we began with Surah to Fatiha and we learned how to ask Allah for guidance. Okay? Give us all guidance. Right? Then we're asking, we find out in Surah Al-Baqarah that Allah responded to our dua and gave us the step-by-step -step approach to guidance in Surah Al-Baqarah. Right? And we got all that we needed. We learned about our beginnings. We learned about that the battlefield is in the heart. Right? That that's the heart. That's the thing that the shaitan is even attacking. Because we go to Surah Al-Nas and we see that he's still, who are you us with Sufi? Nas. He's whispering into the hearts of people So the same place And Allah is saying maradun. Allah We see that Then we go to Ali Imran And we learn that the message in Ali Imran The theme Raisi in, in, in Ali Imran 
is about being firm with the guidance that we've taken. So now we can look at the surah of the Qur'an a lot different, right? Mm -hmm. Now we go to Nisa and we say, now that you have been, you learn how to be firm on your own, you got to take it the next step. Mm -hmm. The next step is to do it to all people. Ya ayyuha nas All people, why? Because these are all your family members. Y'all all come from Adam and Eve, right? No man's going to deny that. So we're all on an equal footing here. And the society is built on not just Muslims, but non-Muslims as well. So in this surah, in order to establish a family, and after establishing a family, what comes next is your community. And after your community comes what? A whole society and the world. And so in order to do that, there are two things you need. Well, there's a number of things you need. The main things would be justice. Al-Adala. So this surah is about establishing adala, justice. And it begins its focus on the women and folk adalik above the women who? No. The orphans. Why? Because the, the, the people who have a, a tie of connection through the womb, they're going to look, that's my cousin, I'm going to look out for him. It's my brother, it's my uncle. I have a reason to look out for him. Even if he's kin, he's an in-law. There's a reason, there's a, a sahar, okay? We have a connection. But what about the orphan? Who's going to advocate for the orphan? No one is obliged except the believers because Allah teaches us in this surah that we start with the orphan. Why? We all know the statement. You're only strong as you're. So Allah makes the weakest link in the society the responsibility of the whole society. And for that reason, it starts off with the yatama. If we give the yatama her rights, and we make about the female, because the female is normally the weaker one in, amongst the men and the woman, the woman is the weaker one. So of course the weaker of the weaker one is the yatama that's a woman. So if we give her her rights, the hope is that everybody else will get their rights. Does that make sense? Yes. And so we start off with how to establish a family. You know, give the woman their sadaqatuhunna nihla as a free gift, as a present, to give them honor and dignity and respect. And you start off that way, the tone will be different as you go in the family, right? And it starts to tell us the rules and regulations of family life. It tells us about inheritance. In the United States, even today, this law is applicable. How many grandmothers and grandfathers or old people have said, look, I'm only going to give the inheritance to the child that took care of me when I got sick. To the child that I like, right? I like that child, never liked them, and I ain't giving them nothing. And they take the rights of inheritance from us. Don't we know that? Yeah. Or I don't trust them. I don't want to leave them the house. I'm giving it to you, baby. And this is vul. And we learn from this surah, from the very beginning, two terms. Al-Adl wa-Dhul. From this point on, whenever you see the word Dhulm in the Qur'an, it means two things. Either the person is an extremist or they are causing oppression. The absence of justice is what it means. And when you look at that, and this is what I'm trying to do for you guys, is learn the terms, what they mean. So that when we see them, we can understand it. Understand the concept of the surah. So when you read it, you can extract from there an understanding of not just the tafsir of the story, but the meaning of the story inside the surah. Because every one of the stories is, stories is contextual for the surah. It's not happenstance. It's not coincidental. In the surah, surah every one of the, the, when we went in surah to Ali Imran, we found that it was about being firm, right? Look at the stories. Each one of the people, when they ran into an issue, the story's told, that person <laughs> is in a state of ibadah, showing that while you're doing ibadah, it allows you to be firm in the face of the challenge that you're looking at, right? Well, who are, fil who are you? Salli fil mihrab. Right? He was praying, offering salah. And then again, those also letting us know that every aspect of our religion predates Islam. It's vital to understand that our religious acts, our salah, our zakah, our siyam, our hajj, and the shahada la ilaha illallah came way before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, we don't even claim it to be the religion of Muhammad. What do we claim it to be? Millat Ibrahim. Hanifan. 
So we have to keep that into context so that it can make us even more confident, even more firm as we go along. Okay? This is the original deen. Yani hayat. And so here in Surah Al-Ali, sorry, Surah Nisa, we can't, we go through some laws, and because of time, I cannot go through all of them, the laws of inheritance, okay? I'm going to pick this up. No, I'm, I'm not going to do the eyes anymore because I'm going to just give briefly to give Yani Khulasa to Surah. Yani, okay, to understand it so we can, we can go on. Allah tells us here in ayah 12 or 13, He says, "Tilka hududullahi wa man yuta'illah wa rasuluhu yudkhilhu jannat intajri min tahti al alha khalidin fiha wa dalik al fauzu al azim." Allah is reminding us after telling us the rules of of, of inheritance, He tells us these are the limits, these are the hudud. Whoever obeys them, then and he obeys Allah and the Messenger, He's going to enter them into the jannat. And then He says, "Whoever yasilaha, but whoever disobeys Allah." The and his messenger, and he becomes aggressive towards the hudud of Allah, then this one is going to the fire. Constantly, from the sunnah of the Quran, meaning the sunnah of Allah, that when Allah tells us what he's going to do good, he tells us what he's going to do to, to us if, as a punishment. When he tells us about a punishment, he tells us about the reward, the good reward. We call it tarheeb or tarheeb. But forget the terms. It's to encourage you and to discourage you. It's to balance. So we can't say we didn't know. We didn't know. And from the things we learned from Surah Al-Baqarah, just the term Baqarah, what do we learn? Not to go crazy about the guidance. Not to try to get so detailed about the guidance that we make it tight. That if we take it and use it to the best of our ability, we have more room in the guidance. But when we seek to, 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 to diminish it, it actually does that. And this point is reiterated when we go further into Surah Al-Ma'idah. Uh, and we, we find out what happened to those people when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to enter into the Al-Quds. Go, the Jews, go enter into the, the sacred city, right? It's going to be a holy land for you. And they refused. What did he do? He made it haram for them. Arba'een hmm. sana. Now because they refuse to obey Allah, Allah refused to give them the benefit that they would have gotten had they obeyed Allah. This is a message for us. So here in Surah uh, Al-Nisa, we're taught about how to establish justice. So we're taught about Tawbah. So it's telling us that we're supposed to turn back to Allah whenever we make a mistake. This is teaching us justice. Justice is kinayatin and it balance. To be balanced and have mercy, okay, on those who are du'afa, those who are weaker in the society. Because that's been fadlina, okay? That's from our graciousness. And the reward will be given in the same vein that you, the action you did. Okay, here it speaks about Ya Yuladina Amanu, do not inherit women, Karahan. And they don't like that. Again, we know the word Karahan. It's disgusting to them. There was the practice that the people would, when their wife, uh, their, their, their brother's wife died, they would inherit the wife. Okay? She just, okay, so now let's say my brother, my older brother or younger brother, his wife, his, my brother passes away. Uh, may Allah not make that happen right now. And his wife, I automatically take her, she's my wife. Automatically, she becomes my wife. The wife has no choice. I just take her. Me and my brothers decide which one of us are gonna take her. Allah's making that haram. But listen, understand, he's not making the whole act haram. He's only making it haram if the woman it doesn't, doesn't like it. Does that make sense? Yes. Because it is a good thing for my brother or me to take that wife, keep her in the family. She's now part of our family. We don't wanna say which we're gonna do, go out by herself now? What if she doesn't have the family? You know, she's used to being with us. So it'd be wise for us to keep her in the family and marry. Because again, this kills the Western idea that everybody's gotta have, be in love with each other and live happily ever after. No dishes, no job, right? No lawn to mow. Because everybody lives happily ever after, right? So this is the point. We, but we do marry to keep community, to keep family intact. This is what we need to understand. The society is based on having a family that's intact. 
so that people have rights and clear rights and connections in this way. Look at a society as grand as America is, it is terrible because it has broken homes all over the place and more breaking every day. And we see the results of that. And this is something that Allah speaks about when he talks about Harut wa Marut in Surah Al-Baqarah. That the extent of the, the evil of the magic, the voodoo that came down, that it, you broke up, you farriqu bayn al-mar'i wa zawji. That it divided the home. And what Fir'aun did, you dhabbihuna abana'ahum wa yastahyuna nisa'ahum. Right? He was making it, destroying the boy's ability at a young age, not allowing them to become men. Because men are going to do things, they're going to establish institutions. And made the woman struggle to survive. Hence, leave and lose their haya. And we see that today. The woman is left out of the marriage. She has to go work. She goes to the job with her hijab on. They say, you can't wear that. Well, what if I wear a little bit? So we just take off the jilbab then. For well, now, stripping. Isn't that like a stripper? The men do the same thing. How many go with their thobes on or cover their aura from the navel to the knee? Stripping too, male strippers. I give you some money, you take off your thobe. I give you some money, you take off your kufi. If I keep going, you gonna keep getting naked? I'm talking to the men, not the ladies. See it every day. Every day. Yeah, you can't work here with that. So we, we, we're compromising for money and then we make, look at the prostitute like she's bad. What's the difference? What's the difference? So we have to think about that. Here it's teaching us how to establish a solid family. And so we keep going through, tell us who we can marry amongst Ahl al-Kitab and who we can eat. First it starts with what we hear about these issues here, what we can eat, who we can marry amongst them. And it's talking about the muhsanat so that we can have pure families and it, it makes sense. You don't want to marry someone who's not able to be in a family. It tells us about don't do deception amongst each other and stealing people's wealth. And don't kill yourselves, commit suicide. And whoever does that, Allah tells them what the, the result is going to be. And then he tells us about major sins. Be just. He knows we're going to sin. He created us forgetful and sinful. But when he's reminded, he remembers. That's why that hishma, that shame is good. So if he's reminded, he remembers. But Allah says, just turn away, turn away from the major sins. The major things that he's told us to stay away from, if we can just do that, then Allah will forgive our minor sins. This is a way uh, uh, of, of purifying ourselves because you know that we, you can't do everything at once so just stay away from the big ones okay you focus on staying away from the big ones does that make sense but you don't look down on the little ones they're not like something just no big deal like a nap but you try your best to stay away from the larger sins and that's the same thing anybody who has an addiction and they tell you like I know some people who are smokers right and they were teaching these people how to stop smoking so they, they said okay just stop smoking after you eat dinner or not in dinner, after you eat your meal. So these guys were smoking, whatever, but they stopped after breakfast. They didn't eat, smoke after, they quit after lunch. They didn't, they quit after dinner. And that was the major pull and draw for the, for the smoking. And then by and by, by stopping at those major times, it eventually led <clears throat> to them stopping all the time. So when Allah is telling us, just stay away from the major sins. Okay, focus on staying and not committing the major sins. This is in that same vein as according to my understanding. Eventually those other ones will become less and less frequent. Does that make sense? And Allah knows best. Allah teaches us, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْءٍ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْجَالِذِ الْقُرْبَى Why is it telling us this? It's telling us the roles of everybody in society. That's what this surah is talking about. The roles, you, me, my neighbor, my mother, my father, what everybody's role is and what you're supposed to do in that context. He says, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's first and foremost. Okay? And don't make shirk regarding that in any shape, form, or fashion. Who comes immediately next? Your parents. 
وبالوالدين إحسانا. And this is a theme that is concurrent in the in the Quran. Constantly we're seeing it over and over and over again. بر الوالدين لن تنالوا البر. Right? وتوفنا مع الأبرار to be righteous and the righteous with the word bir is indicative of righteousness first and foremost to your parents. If your mother calls you and tells you make shirk today, what would you say? Allah says if they call you to shirk, to worship other than me, then do not say no to them. Do not suck your teeth to them. Even if they called you to shirk, we can't say no. وَصَاحِبْهُمَا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ But have a good companionship with them. So all we have to do even, so if they tell you anything less than that, all we got to do is shut up. Don't say nothing. You can't say no to your mother. So there's a rule. If Allah says that you can't say suck your teeth to them when they tell you to make sure, you can't say no to them when they tell you anything that is less than that. And that's the greatest of the crimes, right? So what do you do? Be quiet. Suck it up. Because that's the, the respect that they are due for being your parents. And if you do that, it'll become reciprocal with your children. They'll do that. Does that make sense? No. A lot of times our problems with our children started with our problems with our parents. Okay? It tells us how the men, their role in the society. He tells us the men are the ones who are in charge of the women. And women, it means the women and children. And it tells the women, don't look to see what the men, don't be competing with the men, looking to see what they got, what rights they got, worry about you. Allah said, they have a nasib and you have a nasib. Focus on your job. If everybody would just focus on doing his job. The Prophet ﷺ, he indicated this when he said, When al-Islam, From the excellence and the beauty of a person Islam, is that he leaves those things that don't concern him. And he focused on his job. Mind your business. Not, not from the way we say it in English, like, get out of my business, but focus, mind, focused on your business. And you won't even see or really realize anything else. Because Allah teaches us in Surah Al-Ali Imran about being firm. He says, لا يضيعوا عمل المحسنين, right? He tells us that the action of anybody who does good, من ذكر أو أنثى, male or female, Allah will never let that good deed go to waste. You're going to get credit for it. He recognized it. It's written down. Even if you were married to Fir'aun, Asiya got a house built for her in Jannah. And most of the ladies aren't married to a Fir'aun. You get my point? So, and I mention the ladies because the men are sometimes oppressing the ladies or not doing what the ladies want. We have to understand the role of everyone in society. And that's not to say that the men are doing everything right either. As it says here, the men are responsible. So if the woman and the children in the house is messed up, it's the man's fault. And one of the main things, because they spend their money. And this is one of the biggest problems in all the families that have major problems. One of the major problems is money. Money. And so we as the Muslims, we have to find ways to engage that problem, that challenge. That's the masjid's issue. To find jobs for the men in the community so that they can be productive home rearing people and if there are people without work then there should be an investment made into those individuals to make sure that they get the education and <laughs> skills that they need to work so we can have more families more men working less women without husbands Capish? And this is what he's telling us. And it tells the woman that if you want to be a righteous woman, then the qani tatun hafidatun lil ghaybi bima hafid Allah. He says that they will be home while minding your business, being obedient and preserving your home. So Allah gives us the, the roles backwards and forwards. Allah says that in Allah la yazlimu mithqala dharra. He says Allah does not oppress anyone or take anything away from anyone in Adam. And if you did one ounce of good, Allah is going to multiply it. And He's going to give you from Himself, directly from Himself. Like I said, man, I want you to do me a favor. Let's say uh, Nazir has a big company, he's a mogul. MashaAllah. May Allah make you rich and millionaire. Quadruple millionaire. Multiple bills. Say, Ameen. 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 Allahumma Ameen. And I go to Him for a favor. He says, listen, I'm going to get my man to do it. I got 
talk to my managers. I said, no, I want you to take care of it yourself. Does that make sense? That's a special thing. I want you, could you, could you take this personally? This is what it means when Allah says, min ladunhu. It means personally, directly from him. You get my point? <coughs> not assigning a, a Jibreel min ladunhu, directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ajaran azim. We can only imagine, and we can't even imagine. Ya ayu al-ladhina aminu u... Ya al-ladhina... Subhanallah, subhanallah. It reminds those people to who are the people of the book to believe in the book. And Allah says, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bi wa yaghfiru ma dun thalika liman yasha. He says, Allah does not does not forgive that we make shirk, but he'll he'll forgive anything else be, besides that. What's important here to understand? Sometimes we look at the Muslims who have now we have a lot of Muslims, not a lot. This surah talks about homosexual women, and it talks about homosexual men. Okay. In the beginning, it starts talking about sihaf. You know, it talks about that and what the, what to do about that. So sometimes we, and especially nowadays, people come to him. Oh, he's a kafir. No, he's not a kafir. It's a serious crime. But Allah subhanahu wa taala, we can't say he's not going to jannah. <coughs> Allah says that Allah will not allow the person who makes shirk go to jannah, right? But He says, ma dhalika But He said He'll forgive anything else He wants. We have to put it into context. It ain't by what we want, by what we think. It's what Allah has said. I'm not trying to lighten that sin. I'm trying to put us in our place with regards to what we say sometimes because we can get ourselves in trouble by saying what Allah is going to do when Allah didn't say that. Does that make sense? Yes. And the biggest sin in the world that you speak about Allah what you don't know. So here we, we continue in the surah about Allah telling us how He sent down different prophets and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to make the istighfar. Making istighfar raises up the sins from us. He tells us how to treat, uh, again, the women, the children. And the people who say, Rabbana akhritna min hadhi al dhalim, telling the men that you're going to have to be ready to fight to defend your families. It speaks about this in this surah because Allah is being balanced. Okay? Allah says, Ya ayu al ladina amanu khudu hidrakum, fanfiru thubatin awin firu jami'an. Oh, you believe, take your proper precautions. Take your precautions. Okay? Sorry? Tie your camera. Tie your camel in a sense, it's referring to defending yourself, defending your family, okay? Being in a position to defend your family. Some of us, you know, back in the days in the United States, if you met a Muslim in the 60s and the 70s, he knew martial arts. It was a given. That they, they, those guys were fighters, okay? And that was like something, you know, you, you thought, I thought, you know, hey, that was part of it. <laughs> Become Muslim, you go to the dojo, right? <laughs> Sometimes the masjid was the same place, you know, yeah. as the dojo. Right, yeah. But we've lost that tradition and we need to go back to it. So because we're supposed to be competent and capable, okay, in order to take care of our precious gems, our wives and our children. It sets a tone. It is preventive. You don't see those guys busting into masjid the top or trying to shoot nothing. Nope. <laughs> nope. No, they won't, they won't even try. They won't even go to the nation of Islam and they're not even on the Sunnah or even Muslim because they know that they're going to be met with, with a, a, a marhaban bikum. <laughs> Welcome. They might get it and lock the doors behind them. You, you guys get my point? Yeah. Yeah. I really honestly don't think they would even make it inside Masjid al-Taqwa because of the level of security that is on the, on the starts on the street with those places. But so they go to places that they know they can get away with that type of bullying, okay? And you notice they always go to a majority immigrant community to stand outside and call them all types of terrorists. They never go to a, a, a community where there's a large number of indigenous white, Latino, or African descended Muslims because we know and they know that they would probably get beat down or, 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 or something terrible would happen to them, you know? And it's not wrong for those people to defend themselves. But we know that the immigrant population is more gentle because they really don't understand these kufar here. 
And they think, well, maybe they don't know no better. Let me talk to him and everything that these people, they don't know any better. But that's not going to help them. You just expose yourself to more harm. So Allah is teaching us to be ready to protect ourselves and defend ourselves when need be, without going too far, being just. Justice is to do what is supposed to be done without exceeding the limit or doing too little. And you have to be able to protect your family if you're going to have a family. It's part of the job. I'm going to end it here because there's nothing more I can say here except that Allah ends the surah again by saying, Ya ayyuhal nas, Qad ja'akum ur rasulu bil haqqi min rabbikum, fa aminu khayran lakum. Just like it began, Ya ayyuhal nas, it ends. Ya ayyuhal nas, O oh mankind. Qad ja'akum, it has already come to you. You know, the truth from your Lord. Okay, so believing in this is the best thing for you. Okay, Allah, everything belongs to Allah in the earth <coughs> and in the heavens. Okay, and Allah knows everything and it's all wise. And I want to make another point. I, I said this before, I want to repeat it just to make it clear. Ya Yuhanas only comes in as the head of a surah, starting a surah in two places in the Quran. And that's very, to me, that's amazing. Only two places in the Quran does Ya Ayyuhal Nas start a surah. In the beginning, first half, and in the beginning, second half. In the beginning, first half, it says, Ya Ayyuhal Nas, ittaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. And it tells us of our beginnings, all of creation's beginnings. And that's why it says Ya Ayyuhal Nas as well. Everybody know we came from the Muslim, the Kafir, we come from Adam. And then the second one, the second <laughs> half of the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nasu taqullaha inna zalzalata sa'atun shay'un azim. And it starts to talk about, oh mankind, fear Allah. Don't you know that the convulsions of the hour is something mighty, azim. I can't even translate the word azim. Great, you know, substantial, meaning it's telling us our beginnings as we go into the next world. You get the point? So in both sides, in the first half, it's our beginnings coming into this dunya. And the second half, I am Surah Hajj, in the beginnings as we go, and look, the Surah is called Hajj, the pilgrimage. <laughs> that journey that we're making into the next world. Please read Surah to Nisa. Understand that Surah to Nisa is about establishing a righteous family. The, the opposite of that is found in Surah to Lahab, where it talks about a family. And it describes a family, a husband, the two pillars of the family, husband and wife, as they ta'awanu al ithmi wal udwan. Okay, as they cooperate with each other to do sinful and animosity filled activities, and it tells you how that family ends. This one from Surah Tunisa ends with, inshallah, the family going to Jannah. And we know what happened to the family. Well, we'll tomorrow we'll finish Surah Tul Lahab and move into uh, Surah Tul Al Ma'idah, the Last Supper. And why do you call it Al Lahab Lahab? It is called Masjid. Why do I call it Surah Tul Lahab? Yeah, Jews with that. These surahs have many names. No. Okay? A tawbah, surah to hamd. What's the surah we call it? Surah to fatiha. I sometimes forget that it's called al fatiha because it's called surah to hamd. When Ahlul Quran, we call it by normally the first words that are tied to it or the main theme in that regard. So it's not wrong to call it surah to lahab because tadullu ala ala yani al surah, al ma'na fi surah. Hamd? Well, it, it, just to tell you, he's called Surah Al Lahab. I try to remind myself because do you know why he's called Abu Lahab and is not his name Abdul Uzza? Because his name was <laughs> Abdul Uzza, but Allah refused to call him Abdul Uzza in the Quran, so so that someone wouldn't imagine that there really is someone you could worship called Uzza. 
And he establishes by after the, the, the absence of ubudiyah to anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? There is no Abdul Uzza, huwa Abu Lahab, even though we know bil Arabiya to kenna to krimu. Right? To give someone their, their kunya is to honor them. But in this one, no. Yunasibuhu is better that we, we call him Abu Lahab as opposed to what his given name was, because that given name is a lie. Does that make no. sense? So for these types of things, I try to remind myself so that I can pass that on. Okay? Who are Abu Lahab? Well, I don't want to give the surah away. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika.